the attitude of uh, opening, relaxing, opening, receiving the present moment. Here and now, Pachubana Tamma, Santitiko Akalika Tamma. Now, by reflecting in this way, when I use these words, Santitiko Akalika, that over the years, these Pali terms, uh, it's a reminder, you know, like a reflecting reminder of, because one can come into this shrine room full of uh, views, opinions, feelings, emotions, uh, caught up in one's own sense of self. <clears throat> and, one, and this is what we're used to in the world of suffering in the sangsara, of axes to grind, resentments, duties to perform, on and on like this, that we carry around with us, where we, get, we come into the shrine room or return to the kuti or whatever, we can carry these burdens with us. So, using this santitiko, akaliko, parent here and now timeless, Dhamma, the word Dhamma is <clears throat> the way it is. Now, when reflecting in this way, then it puts me in this in this state of uh, of awareness. I'm, I'm not trying to. I'm more looking, observing, rather than uh, f- full of myself or just operating on. Uh, uh, from habits and getting lost in my thoughts, loves and hates, and so forth. So even though these are words, uh, like any other thing, they're conventions not to be clung to. They're, they can be used skillfully, skillful means, reminding. Because we forget, we get lost into the problems of life, the world, the society, the self. And uh, this, this seems to be such such a powerful realm, the human body, uh, the sensory world, planet Earth, the universe that we are exposed to in these vulnerable forms is, you know, it's pretty powerful experience of impingement, of pleasure, pain, through the senses and through the mind. So then the perspective is Santitiko Akalika Dhamma. Not trying to sort it out and organize it in nice kind of uh, alphabetical order or in put everything in neatly into little categories. Because that's an endless task, as you well know, to try to try to sort out the samsara, codify it and organize it. <clears throat> so the, then the Buddha said, awaken to it. All conditions are impermanent. So pay sankarani cha. So it like, gives us this sense of, of observing the changingness of phenomena rather than trying to organize it, sort it out, uh, get rid of the the bad stuff, censor it, edit it, pick and choose. But just recognizing the samsara, the conditioned phenomena is this, the thought, the emotion, the sense of me and mine, doubt, worry, anxiety, fear, greed, hatred, and delusion, rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, vinyana,
Now in this, in the five khandhas, for example, it's the attachment. It's always this <coughs> upadana that is the cause of suffering. Well, the upadana or clinging attachment in Thai they think yet man, ter man. To hold on to, cling to, attach to conditions out of ignorance. It's not even the attachment to conditions that is the problem, it's the ignorance. So and that's why we're, we're creatures of habit. You know, we become habituated. So we, we get used to our ignorance and our suffering and our sense of self, no matter how uh, negative or miserable our creations can be, at least we're used to them. What we're used to is, is a, you know, it's habitual. It's, it's easier to, to just sink into what you're used to than to reflect on it. So this reflecting or sati sampachanya is, you know, no longer sinking into the momentum of habit, but observing it. We're not trying to get rid of habit, but recognize it. It's like shifting out of just the helpless, helpless uh, surrender to to suffering and self toward investigating, towards looking into. This is sati, uh, sampachanya, panya. Yoniso manasikara. These words convey the sense of investigating, looking into, observing, witnessing. So this is like a skillful use of, of thought, of conception, of language. It's, it's thinking and language, and these, are, these aren't the real problems. It's uh, ignorance, avicca is the cause of misery. You know, not understanding nature, not having reflected, observed, not having awakened to reality, then we are caught in this uh, vortex, this whirly, sense of whirling around of fear and anxiety, worry, of seeking happiness, trying to find kind of permanent happiness and and uh, fearing about suffering, pain, misery, loss. And so, uh, you know, the samsara is, is a mode of perception. When we, you know, there's another word, but these words like nibbana, samsara, are words like anything else, you know, they can be we see them as as opposite to each other, you know, there's nirvana and then samsara as opposed. But they are just modes of perception, a changing from the samsaric mode is the me and mine, me, myself, my life, my body, my feelings, my views, and the habitual Patterns I've created through that ignorance of self-view, sakititi silabhatabharamasa. So samsara then is when I when I surrender to the mode of samsara, then I see everything from this very personal way. You know whether I like it, don't like it, prove, disapprove, whether I fear it or dread it or want something, not wanting something, get my feelings hurt. If I don't get my own way, I get upset. Somebody criticizes me or makes fun of me, I feel angry or hurt, offended. If somebody praises me, it makes me feel, you know, on a personal level that I'm all right, I need praise and acceptance, I need smiling faces and nurturing and love from you all to support my sense of well-being as a person. And this is a sangtharic mode of perception, me, what I need. I want the world to to nurture and support me 
and respect me and love me and then then the fear of of it all of not getting that of being rejected ridiculed harmed offended so you know one can operate from that perspective from the and this is this is when i talk about listening to the inner voices i'm not talking about schizophrenia <laughs> i'm talking about you know, listening to samsara. Listen to the uh, samsaric mode. You know, the sense of yourself as a separate person, as an, uh, as an identity, as what you're used to, what the world, what the conventional world uh, calls you and ex- what you think it expects of you and you know, fears, loves and hates, worries, anxieties, needs, desires. So when, we're, when we don't awaken, then we are kind of stuck into that mode of perception, the samsara. We, we don't know how to, you know, we, we haven't really awakened to it, so we, we become this personality. We become this, this needy person, this person that wants and doesn't want, that fears and all kinds of things is threatened by life, wants happiness, fears, suffering, <clears throat> worries about death, frightened of death. And so this is a this is a dukkha, the first noble truth, is this ignorance of being being bound and kind of stuck. It's more like being stuck into this vortex. It's like a whirling vortex of thoughts and emotional habits. That as you get older, they just get more stuck and repeat themselves over and over again. By the time I was 30 years old, I was so fed up with myself, hearing the same old whinging complaints. And, you know, at the age 30, which now seems quite young. But I was pretty much set in my ways by the age of 30, you know, in the, in the being caught in this, in this uh, sense of a self, being stuck into it, and yet sensing that there's, you know, there must be a way out or something more to life than just spending 30 more years thinking and <laughs> repeating the same old emotional patterns and thoughts and that that I acquired the first 30 years of my life. I remember thinking it's depressing. I think I have to spend 30 more years with these kind of thoughts, this, this sense of the self, you know, this critical self. As a cri- I had a very, a very self-critical habit, you know, nagging, inner kind of nagging t- tyrant that that was always uh, kind of putting me down. And it was a habit, tendency, but, uh, but it was, it had, you know, kind of become fixed, had become a habitual pattern by the age of 30. So I remember on my 30th birthday, I was in uh, Malaysia. I was in this beautiful... Uh, place on the east coast of Borneo in Sabah. I was thinking, 30 years old now. That meant I was middle-aged. Now I think of 30 as young. (laughs) But then, uh, and I thought, if I have to spend 30 more years like this, with these habits, now the place was, was a kind of tropical paradise lovely place, but the mind, the, the habit patterns of, uh, that I'd acquired up to age 30 would always, they were like, they would dampen everything down, kind of make life difficult when it needn't be, a kind of joylessness, a kind of bound, a kind of enslaved to, to negative uh, mental states. So then the next 30 years were spent examining all this. Came a monk, <laughs> 40 years now, 
since I was 30? 42 years. 42 and a half years. <laughs> and so, I mean, it, it's changed, you know, because the, the practice of meditation was the actual kind of, uh, was the kind of intuition I had even then at 30. This, this interest in Buddhism, I re- you know, I began to, this was, this seemed to be the only way out of the, this, this whirling vortex of unhappiness. So it was a more of an intuition, you know, sense that that this was probably the way to do it. And so following year went to Thailand and proceeded to develop looking looking at Dhamma, changing from this mode of perception of samsara of self toward looking towards changing that to Dhamma, seeing Dhamma, knowing Dhamma, rather than criticizing samsara, loving it, hating it, seeing myself in terms of, um, you know, what's wrong or what's not, it's not good enough, the critical mind. So then Nibbana is usually the, what, you know, the opposite of samsara. And Nibbana isn't a place or, or something, you know, it's not any, any objective place or thing you can grasp. It's a word. Nibbana is, is another word. But it's a mode of perception, a way of looking that is non-grasping. It's not, it's not, it's not the habit pattern uh, that comes from avicca or ignorance. And so samsara, say when we're, we're lost in the, in the whirling vortex of samsara, then it's like we're, we're, we're bound to birth and death all the time. The condition's changing. And we're kind of stuck in that motion. We have no way out of it. We're merely kind of swimming in this, uh, sea of sharks. And then uh, Nibbana is seeing it. We're no longer just caught in the momentum of change, but observing change. Being the knowing, being that observing. It's put the mode of perception changes from being caught in the flow and movement of changing conditions to observing changing. So, Nibbana always implies non-attachment to conditioned phenomena. Realizing Nibbana means realizing non-attachment. It's like this. Awareness then. Awareness is is to to be aware there's non-attachment. That's why trying to become aware is is impossible. You know, if if you hold on to trying to become someone who is aware, you're you're attached to the concept of awareness and a sense of self, that you're somebody who isn't aware or your awareness isn't very good or you're not very mindful and you should be and you're trying to become aware, you're, you're stuck, still stuck in this, in this samsaric mode of perception. As long as you create yourself as somebody who needs to do something or get rid of something, you're still operating from samsara, from the from the conditioned realm, from ignorance, from avicca. So that's why it's frustrating after years of meditation, you know, trying to purify yourself and attain states. Why do some people just feel such despair? You know, when they've been moral and good and and um, industrious, worked hard, and still because they. The mode of perception still stuck into samsara. You know, so even as a monk or a nun, you can still be stuck into that, into the identity, the clinging, the attachment to the conditions of monasticism, to the sense of your self-worth, to the critical mind, to desire, and, and have no, no other way of perceiving, to just from this self-view of what have I attained, what have I achieved. But that's all about self, isn't it? That's samsara. After 40 years of monastic life, 
celibacy and so forth. What have I achieved? Have I achieved something by devoting myself to being a Buddhist monk for 40 years? Now that is all Sakyaditi, Sila Bhattabharamasa, isn't it? It's still operating from samsara. So then shifting out of samsara isn't like, you know, isn't like asking impossible. It's really changing the mode of perceiving. Not me trying to attain nibbana, but awakening, mindful, observing change, observing the self, observing uh, sakhyaditi, being the knower of stila patabharamasa, of which he kicha. And that's why we call that sati sampatanya, because it's nothing, it's not, not like a, a, a refined state of consciousness that you, you get through control. So it's not a matter of controlling and, and kind of sorting everything out to, get, to uh, live in a more refined, sensoric condition realm, but awakening, simple, imminent attentiveness in the present. And then to trust that, you know, the, because when you start thinking about it, again, you're back in samsara. You think, am I really practicing right? Am I just deluding myself? Or, you know, this person says I need to get rid of my anger. I need to change. I need to develop this. And and I see so many things in myself that, you know, are not very good. And how do I get rid of fear and anxiety and self-consciousness and so forth and you read the scriptures and you can still read scriptures from the self view and that's the problem you can read the Pali suttas still from samsaric uh, positioning from the mode of samsara so it, you know that's the thing the problem with Bariyate Dhamma isn't it? Is it it still it still hasn't you know one can still be caught in Sakya Ditti Sila Bhatta Bharamasa Vichikicca and read uh, scriptural text. So in uh, Vipassana meditation, it's like insight, looking into. It's not, not analysis or, or it's not reason and logic. It's, it's the different, different mode of perceiving from this Nibbana position. Now when you think about yourself as, as looking at things from Nibbana, you, you know, the self, you know, if you're a self-disparaging type person and you think, I have no right to think I can look at things from the Nibbana position, I don't dare. And I'm probably brought you guys. There's people saying, Ajahn Tomato says he's, he's, uh, he's in Nibbana and uh, that could be Brajika. Uh, Utri Manusa Tamang, you know, where you're boasting about your attainments. And so even the word, you know, becomes precious. The word nibbana can become so exalted that we d- we d- we're afraid of using it. But it's I'm not looking at it in terms of preciousness or being some sacred word. It's merely a word. So it's it's uh, it's for you know it's a helpful word if you use it properly. So recognizing just observing the difference between samsaric, which is full of me and mine, fears and doubts, conceit. Uh, anxiety, worry, uh, self-consciousness, resentment, bitterness about the past, fear about the future, or shifting out of samsara to the nibbanic mode is observing, being the witness of change, of self. It's not getting rid of self or trying to make yourself into a better self. It's observing self in whatever way it manifests, whether it's a nice self or a horrible self, positive or negative self, self is not the issue of, of whether it's, it's positive or negative, good or bad, but it's conditioned, you know, all sape sankarani cha. So from this perspective of nibbana, of observing, then in just learning to trust in that mode, you act, to actually observe and witness it, there's non-attachment operating already. It's not I. I become someone who's no longer attached. It's 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 automatic. So say mindfulness is the path to the deathless. 
Mindfulness is the deathless. <laughs> and a way of just, of, you know, using words to remind, to, to, to help us remember this. Because the pull of, of the power of the Sangsaric Vortex is, is, is still can be very strong until you, your confidence, until you're really confident in awareness. Now, it's not a self-confident, the sense of I'm really, you know, I'm aware. It's recognizing awareness is this, and trusting it, and cultivating it in daily life. And over the years, uh, in monastic life, learning to, no matter what happens to me on a personal level or in communal life, this reference, you know, of observing the, rather than, you know, being caught in, in the thing, the praise and blame that are an ev- inevitable part of human experience. I think one of the, in t- Thailand, for example, with Lung Po Chai, <clears throat> I found that uh, because they, in that uh, kind of Ajahn Man tradition in Thailand, Thai forest tradition, uh, you know, they, uh, the, they use the, the mantra, Puto, which is in in Thai Thai language is it's uh, the the B becomes a P so instead of Buto Buddha it's Puto so you have to get used to the um, to Thai Thai pronunciation <laughs> so when uh, in uh, <laughs> when I first went there you know this is what you know the talking about Puto and Puru and, and they translate it Puru, and in Thai Puru is to know, and Pu always implies a some something somebody that knows. Well, I found this very interesting because because this this mantra Puto could be just you know you could just use it to for tranquility, and you know, just by repeating it and and over and over to stop the wandering thoughts. Just this two-syllable word, puto, you know, one could just use it to tranquilize, you know, calm down and stop the mind from, the thinking mind from wandering. But then, Lung Pan is always saying, the the one who knows, puru, puto. So this, this became very strong, uh, kind of reminder to me over the years. It's so simple, so utterly simple, getting right down to, to the very word Buddha. You know, it's not, it's not, you know, not you know, kind of high-flown Abhidhamma terms or, you know, it's not using the intellect in, in the kind of fantastic ways, but it's taking the very essence, the very the heart, the core, the very the, the liberating, the, the, the path of liberation right from the beginning, puto, not attachment to views about Buddha or anything like that, but just that two-syllable word, and then then you, the, the 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 knowing it implies this knowing. So this is the the knowing from the nibbana perspective, isn't it? The mode of nibbana, puro, is is not not knowing from not knowing about things from the personal view. It's not like me as a person. Uh, knowing a lot about Buddhism or Dhamma or Vipassana or anything else. So almost, you know, so, you know, over the years it's always a kind of <laughs> marvelous kind of simplicity and directness, just right from the very beginning of Puto. Because in, in beginning to in- investigate that, you know, it, it's, it's putting me into this, it's all, almost forces me into this mode of reflection, of observing, rather than somebody trying to purify myself, get rid of my anger and greed and lust and fears and desires, and trying to become a good bhikkhu, trying to fit into the Thai forest tradition, trying to, uh, you know, from the personal level, there are all these factors going on. You know, me, Praparang, a foreign monk, uh, trying to learn Thai, trying to fit into the system, trying to keep all the rules, trying to become, trying to 
get along, trying to survive. It's full of me and mine, you know, a sense of me trying to fit into a, a different set of conventions, a different way of living, in a different climate, different culture. And it's fraught with the uh, sakyaditi. You know, because you're, you're frustrated, you're you feel love, hate, you feel all kinds of emotional reactions to to the changing conditions. And then the then the puru, the but puto. Now this this uh, this I found incredibly helpful because it it you know, it put me into this observing position, a listener, rather than always trying to sort it out on the samsaric level of conditions. You know, that, that I don't think I could have survived on that level. <laughs> I'm just trying to, you know, make myself, you know, fit in just not as an act of will or, uh, you know, just through bloody mindedness or whatever, or just, you know, resignation to fate or whatever, or the way that, that, uh, Sakya did, he operates in me. You know, my, particular style of Sakya Ditti. <laughs> yes, uh, but because of, of that, that, you know, when, when I think back of those early years with Ajahn Chah, uh, it's uh, very much that Puru, that Puto, that perspective, because I caught on to that almost immediately. Where before I'd always regarded Buddha in terms more like from Sila Bhattabaramasa, more on a conventional level. You know, the the historical Buddha, Gotama the Buddha, or a kind of, and then in Zen forms like that, they talk about Buddha nature. So then I can see Buddha nature as some kind of, you know, as something or other. And, and then it's like, I've got to get it. I've got to find out what my Buddha nature is. So, so then the, the self grabs the, the words Buddha nature and they try to say, what is that? You know, I have to develop my Buddha nature. Uh, and then I'm still in the samsara, in the, the sakya, sakya ditti. And then all the doubts about sotapanna, sakadar, kamyana, kamyana, the path. <laughs> and, and the way that sakya ditti grasps those terminologies. You know, so it's like trying to become a, a stream enterer or become an arahant from the Sakya Ditti level through reading the scriptures. Because it sounds like you become, you know, you become, somebody becomes an arahant in the scriptures. And you, to me, that sounds like, you know, and on the level of Sakya Ditti, if that's all I'm operating from, that's all I know, then. It's like, I'm not an arahant, and I've got to work hard in order to become one. Can I become pure enough? Can I really become pure enough to become an arahant before I die? And I, that's pure sakyadidi, the whole thing. <laughs> and so, switching on the light to sakyadidi, rather than trying to just get rid of sakyadidi, it's still sakyadidi. You know, so trying to to stop thinking and get rid of conceit and doubt just through willful acts, it's still Sakya Ditti. I've got to stop. I've got to get rid of. I, I shouldn't be conceited. I should be humble. So humbleness means I don't dare assume that I could ever become an Arahant. That's just too high up. Because, you know, the, my, my Sakya Ditti level is, it likes humility. You know, doesn't like to, doesn't want to promote myself in that kind of boasting way, you know. If anybody's going to get there, I'm going to get it. Even though I'm an American, I don't tend to think like that. <laughs> so I have more, I'm more English in that respect. More <laughs> oh, I don't think I, you know, I have so many kind of problems and... I don't, don't dare assume that I could ever achieve that. And so I a humble goal, I, if I just become a better person, I've not wasted my life. So I've made humble, go, kind of humble,
goals for myself in the beginning. But it's still Sakyaditi. And it's still whether you think you're 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 the one that's going to get there before anyone else, or you don't dare assume uh, such grandiose uh, ambitions. <laughs> it's all Sakyaditi, the whole thing. <laughs> so, so then the, it's like switching on the light, isn't it? It's, it's from the nibbanic level, you're observing this. Sakya Ditti is like this. And so obvious, the base Ankarani Cha, we chant that all the time. All conditions are impermanent. So it's a reminder, continuous reminder. So that includes everything. Everything you think or feel. Happy, sukha, dukkha, atukha, matsukha, vedana, arrogance and pride and, uh, or humility, sense of being a, you know, not being someone in any way, whether you're a humble person or an arrogant person, it's still person. The person is the, still the, the illusion. So then you get into, you know, things like, well, pool rule, you know, the one who knows. Is there, what is it that knows? And, and so then we start thinking about it again, you know. What is it that is observing the self? If if I'm if I'm operating now from the nibbana perspective, the mode of observing, what is it that knows, or who? And so then this 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 uh, the doubt arises, and uh, this is where there's knowing, isn't there? It's not somebody knowing, because I can't find somebody knowing anything. But it is certainly knowing as an active functioning reality in the present. And, and you don't want to call it anything because it's not Sakya Didi. I can't say it's me and I'm, I'm the one that knows. Because that takes thought again, isn't it? It's, still, it? it's like claiming it as some kind of personal achievement. But it's certainly knowing. It's, it's 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 real, you know. It's not made up, overblown kind of desires operating. It's a, this this watching, observing, listening, attentiveness to the changing conditions, the physical, the the sensory, the emotional, the psychic. Refined course or anywhere in between, because conditioned phenomena has that, you know, has that wide spectrum of the best to the worst, the refined to the coarse. You know, so this, uh, this is the qualities are, you know, so vast. The changing the qualities of samsara, so that the perspective from the mode of nibbana is the observing. The the changingness, rather than than uh, judging the qualities, or trying to control things by trying to hold on to refinement and suppressing coarseness. So then there's there's the listening to observe. You know, I've I've done these. I've talked about investigation of space through visual sense of sight. You know, you observing, witnessing space, and investigating it, because <clears throat> you know I found in my life in, in early years as a monk in Wapapong, <clears throat> you know, I, I couldn't understand a lot of you know when they give Lumpa Cha would give talks, or every morning we had to sit through these Vinaya readings. And a monk would get up there in a high seat and read from this text. And I couldn't understand anything, and it was so boring anyway. Everybody was sleeping. <laughs> you know, and the monk that read didn't seem to have any sense of, of trying to make it interesting. And then he just, just droned from the high seat, and everybody looked, you know, like they were falling asleep. This would go on for, it seemed like, Hours, but it probably wasn't that long. <laughs> but then, in terms of, of uh, you know, reflecting, 
and on how I developed a version to this monk reading from this text and observing, observing this, this, uh, you know, hating this monk, thinking he's insensitive and he's boring and they shouldn't allow him to do this and this is, you know, putting me off, you know, if it's not, not kind of encouraging me at all and, and, uh, you know, I get very negative about it. But then there's also this puto observing this, these reactions. And then the, then the superior comes in, you should, you shouldn't be so petty. You know, he's doing his best. This monk is, is offered to do this. You should respect his good intentions. And, and you can't judge it because you don't know the language. And it is rather, you know, it's a, it's not an easy text to read anyway. I, I think even if you're fluent in Thai, <laughs> and it's boring. Vinaya is, you know, very boring subject anyway. So, so uh, you know, to me, <laughs> so, so it's uh, you know this. You know, then I start criticizing myself, rules and and the kind of going into details of what is an offense and what isn't, and and it's just you know just uh, on that level get so frustrated by all this seemed like incredible fussiness. Then the watching of this feeling, the pu 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 to, puru, the knower of this. And I began to just, you know, investigate this sense of oh, what a miserable mental state I'm making around all this. Conceit, there's a lot of conceit, a lot of views, a lot of misery, because I said they're miserable you know, resenting it, fulminating in my resentments, waiting for him to finish, all these negative states. So then switching on the light, observing, puto. And then visually, you know, just seeing how, how even as Buddhist monks, you know, I would start making personalities out of the different monks. I like this one, this is a good monk, I don't like that monk. You know, and then we, the whole point of being a monk is getting, you know, kind of diminishing the sense of personality. Shaving the head, wearing a robe, you know, not in terms of, of friends and my, the ones I like, my buddies, my pals, the good monks versus the bad monks. And, but that was very easy to do on the Sakya Diti level. You know, so whether they, you know, whether they have shaven heads and, all that is still you start seeing them as personalities that affect you that you like or don't like. So then uh, I started experimenting because I was interested in 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 this in its space and consciousness. And so I just started observing the space between monks when I'm sitting here, like um, instead of becoming so caught up in, you know, this is a good monk, this is a don't, this one I don't like on a personal level. Letting go of that. Doesn't matter whether, you know, on that level of liking or disliking, but, or whatever, but just the space. And to, to, to observe space, I had to withdraw my, my, uh, interest in the personal reactions I had to the individuals, to the individual monks. So I started observing that, the space between monks uh, during these boring readings. <laughs> anyway, and it was quite helpful because suddenly, you know, I thought in order to really observe space, I had to, you know, withdraw. And it wasn't that getting rid of any monks. I didn't ask them to leave, but just not uh, focusing on and getting caught up in my liking and disliking of any individual. Because the space is the same, isn't it? When you're observing space, it's space between uh, one monk and another. It's, it's not personal anymore. <laughs> you can't say this: the space between this monk and that monk is good or bad or beautiful or ugly or anything like that. It is space, though. So it's like getting this insight into withdrawing this attachment to... Because the, the the personal reactions was all about attachment, isn't it? Sakya titi, kind of, you know, liking, disliking, forming opinions. That's attachment, and then to 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 not attach anymore, but to still be present. I didn't close my eyes and reject the 
the monks, but observing space, because space is here and now. Santitika Akalika Dhamma. Then in, and that led toward, uh, you know, listening. Again, where sound of silence, this background, vibratory, vibration. It has the same sense of spaciousness. It has unlimitedness, in other words. Where personality all has limits, isn't it? This person is like this, that monk is like that, and and uh, it changes according to conditions and so forth. But when it comes to space, visual space, or silence, sound of silence, is, it has this continuity. It doesn't, it doesn't have boundaries. It has this continuity, like space goes on and on and on, doesn't it? And, and sound of silence has no... That's a, it's just a flowing sound or vibration. So when you notice this, you know you stop. You stop thinking. The thinking process stops, and you're. you're but you're still in this position of observing of puto. Is puto still? You know, you're not going into a trance. I don't go unconscious into some kind of absorbed trance. It's just very alert where the I'm not caught in, in just trying to control things or do something or create something or get rid of something. So you notice this, the puru, you, the way it is. Sound of silence is like this. Who's aware of the sound of silence? It seems ridiculous. Question. There's awareness. If I think I'm aware of the sound of silence, then that it's not, there's no I in it. Unless I create, you know, some kind of personal at- attachment to to the perception of sound of silence, but if I'm just with it, just resting in it, in space and in silence and stillness, it's like this. There's the puru, the knowing, the puto, knowing dhamma. You know, the Buddha knows the dhamma, knows the way it is, knows the truth. But it's not like I become Buddha. That whole that whole thing falls away. It doesn't make sense anymore. To you know the the language or the desire to possess anything, there, but there's certainly awakenedness, awakened consciousness, santitika akalika dhamma. So it's this way of reflecting. I encourage you to trust yourselves more <laughs> during this retreat. You get caught in doubts about yourself and criticisms, you observe it. Don't try to get rid of it or think that you shouldn't or believe it, but see it. it switch on the light, the floodlight. You know, awareness. It's like this.